please, John. Please, John, forgive me. I love my wife so much. She's everything to me. All I did was try to protect her. Would you ever shoot someone in the head to protect them? This is Skylar Nemitz. He and Danielle had tied the knot after just five months of dating. But a few more months later, and he took out his rifle and killed his 19-year-old wife. He tried to convince the cops that his gun went off by accident. But it was also Skylar that bragged about being very skilled with guns. So what was the actual truth behind this horrific death? My hand on the right side of her head, and I put it to my chest and I wrap my arm around her. I put it to my chest and I started saying her name. There was no reaction, no movement, no nothing. I couldn't be in there anymore. Couldn't drag me away. It was my wife. This is the full story of Skylar Nemitz, the young soldier who shot his teenage wife and blamed it on an outrageous accident. Today's story begins with a lucky girl. Tara Danielle Ripon was born seven weeks early on January 11th, 1995. She only weighed three pounds. The doctors told her mother she wouldn't survive the night, but through nothing short of a miracle, Danielle pulled through and she got healthier every day. Growing up, Danielle kept a petite figure, which stood in stark contrast with her explosive energy. Her friends at school called her a small stick of dynamite, but tragedy followed Danielle throughout her childhood. When she was only two, her mother died of cancer. She went on to live with her grandmother, but when she was 14, she died too. So during high school, Danielle moved in with her stepfather, Michael Bolton. But Michael also had a pretty tumultuous life, so he wasn't exactly there for Danielle. By now, Danielle was an independent teenager. She loved makeup, cheerleading, and spending time with her friends. And she didn't show the drama at home. She was the type of girl, it's like you knew she had a hard home life, but you would never know it at the same time. She just didn't dwell in it. But it would show in Danielle's behavior. On the one hand, she craved a lot of attention at school, as she didn't get it at home. On the other hand, Danielle had a tendency to get very close to her boyfriends and their families almost overnight. Her coach Aaron remembers every boyfriend was the one she was gonna marry. She always got very close with the families of the boyfriends that she had because they were always the most stable part of her life. But it was just that need to be loved and for that nerve nurturing and that attention. Soon after ending a relationship, Danielle found a brand new one. On Facebook, she met a recent high school graduate who had enrolled in the army and was about to begin basic training in Georgia, Skylar Nemitz. The two hit it off in real life too. Danielle was telling all her friends that Skylar was the one. Skylar was in love too. His family remembers seeing a spark in his eyes that wasn't there before, whenever he was with Danielle. But Skylar's mom, Danette, was shocked to see Danielle move in with her after just one month of dating Skylar. Yep, Danielle made herself a part of Skylar's life in a big way. Danette realized why she was so attached. I felt sorry for her, for her upbringing. I loved spoiling her, you know, because she never had been spoiled. So Danette treated Danielle like a daughter. She was happy to be the stable family Danielle never had. And so was Skylar, at least at first. There's no right time to make certain steps in a relationship, but in Skylar and Danielle's case, things were surely going at a really fast pace. Five months from their first date, just before Christmas 2011, Skylar got back from training with a ring. He took Danielle on top of a mountain and proposed to her. Of course, she said yes. On March 7th, 2012, the same day Skylar completed his training, the two got married at the local courthouse. Danielle was only 17 years old, but she felt ready to quit school and move to Lakewood, Washington, where Skylar was going to be stationed. Danielle's coach was worried, but she knew she couldn't change Danielle's mind at that moment. I felt like I needed to be the person to shake her head and say, slow down. There's no rush. But she's not that type of person. She was just so strong-willed that there was never going to be any convincing her. And there just wasn't an adult in her life that could put a stop to it. From the outside, the young couple seemed picture perfect and happier than ever. Their pictures were dreamy and Danielle had left her whole life behind just to be with Skylar. Who would do that if they weren't happy? Well, a quick zoom in to their relationship might show a much darker picture. Danielle had friends at school, close friends, that knew her life inside and out. But when she met Skylar, she seemed to forget about them. Or rather, he seemed to distance Danielle from them. Danielle's bestie, Michaela Yingling, remembers, he took her away and they moved away so quick, like nobody really got to know him. He ignored us. And on the few occasions that Danielle visited Michaela with Skylar, 
The two friends would chat a while while Skylar would sit in a corner and refuse to participate in the conversation. James Peltier also noticed this strange behavior. James used to be Danielle's neighbor before she moved in with Skylar's family. He was like a father to Danielle, and he was concerned when he met Skylar that he didn't even make basic casual conversation. I think I shook his hand and back to the car he went and he left. At first, James decided he would not think too much about it. Perhaps Skylar was just a little social awkward. But then, Danielle told him about Skylar's anger issues. One time, Skylar grabbed her iPhone and smashed it to bits in a fit of anger. Then, he rushed out to buy her a brand new phone. But this only gave him leverage over her. After all, he was the one paying for her phone, so he wanted her under his thumb at all times. When James heard about this, he sat her down. I sat her face to face and I said, I just need to know if there's any big problem because all you have to do is tell me you don't want to be with him anymore. And I said, I can guarantee you the boy won't even come through that door. And she's like, no, I love him. I forgive him. Two years passed like this. Danielle continued to show a happy face to her friends, refusing to talk about her issues at home. Or if she did, she'd quickly change the subject afterward. She enrolled in a local high school to finish her senior year, got a puppy, and got a job at a granite counter company. Meanwhile, she posted YouTube makeup tutorials. It was her dream to become a famous YouTuber. Thank you guys for watching my video and I will check you later. But Danielle was also a gun enthusiast just like Skylar. The two would even go to shooting ranges together after work. Skylar's friends and family knew he'd been passionate about guns long before enrolling in the army. He fired his first rifle when he was a kid, and he bragged to his friends about his shooting skills. By 2014, he'd amassed 15 customized weapons. And on Danielle's 19th birthday, she received a blue AR-15, customized by her husband. This is just one of the details that makes this case so tragic. In March 2014, Danielle and Skylar celebrated two years since their marriage, but things weren't going that well. While Danielle's BFF Michaela got pregnant, Skylar didn't let Danielle attend her baby shower. And during the girls' FaceTime calls, Michaela noticed that Danielle was often worrying about getting the house in order for Skylar. Like when I asked her when Skylar coming home and she's like, oh, well, I have to clean this before he gets home and I have to shampoo the carpets make sure everything's uh, in perfect order. Danielle seemed afraid of the consequences if she didn't clean up the house perfectly. Skylar's fits of anger were the norm inside their house, but Danielle tried to hide these from her friends. Did she feel like they would judge her for loving him? Would she hear I told you so for marrying him before getting to know him better? Whatever the reason, Danielle didn't want to reveal her unhappiness, but it would seep through every now and then. When James asked Danielle if she was afraid of Skylar, she replied, only when he's been drinking. Well, that shouldn't be the case in any relationship let alone a young married couple. Skylar and Danielle's neighbors also reported hearing daily arguments between the two of them, and they had to be pretty loud to be heard from the neighboring house. The topic, Skylar didn't trust Danielle, and he was afraid she would cheat on him. One recurrent theme was Danielle's friendship with Jeremy Henry, a childhood friend and former schoolmate. When he accused her of cheating on him with Jeremy via text message, Danielle replied, you have either insecurities you need to work on or you don't trust me when it comes to hanging out with Jeremy. But Skylar's texts to his wife were pretty horrible, and not just when he was referencing Jeremy. Here are some of the things he wrote to Danielle in 2014. Danielle, what the f We have Amazon, you don't need the prime shit. Come on, can you ask before you shit with my money? Thanks, you're an idiot. Yeah. This is how Skylar spoke to his 19-year-old wife. First, he promised her a perfect new life where he would provide and care for her. Then, he monitored her transactions, told her off for spending his money and downright insulted her whenever he felt like it. And sadly, this was small potatoes compared to what Skylar was about to do. In September 2014, Skylar left for a three-week training program. On the day he got back, on October 16th, Danielle FaceTimed Michaela. She told her how happy she was that Skylar was back home. Michaela saw Skylar too in the background. He sat on the couch and seemed to be in a good mood. Danielle told Michaela she loved her and that she couldn't wait to speak to her again. 12 minutes later, 911 received a grueling call. Hear someone screaming? I'm their neighbor and I heard a shot go off. The husband said that she's dead. So the male told you that his wife is dead? Yes. A few minutes later, the emergency services arrived at Skylar and Danielle's house. But it was their neighbor, not Skylar, that greeted the officers. 
I heard a gunshot go off. And then I heard some screaming after that. They were just saying, oh my God, oh my God. In fact, the police found Skylar cleaning the apartment as his wife laid on the floor with a hole in her head. And yeah, Skylar had fired at Danielle in the back of the head with the very rifle that he'd bought her for her birthday. He told the police he was cleaning the rifle when it accidentally went off straight into Danielle's head. As you can imagine, this sounded pretty far-fetched from the get-go. So we locked the apartment down to conduct the death investigation. He's now the male that's in the apartment is uh, on his way over to the station. In the police car, Skylar seemed to realize the gravity of the situation for the first time. <laughs> Skylar blabbered on about how he was going to clean his gun and then come up to Danielle from behind and kiss her neck. Then he stopped crying and started cursing. Danielle. Even before getting to the police station, Skylar behaved in a suspicious way. First, he told his neighbors that Danielle had hurt herself. Then, when the police arrested him, he said he was cleaning his rifle, but he couldn't justify why he hadn't made the 911 call himself. Why were the neighbors more eager to save Danielle's life? Then, inside the police car, he went from one mood to another in the blink of an eye, repeatedly. And although he made several sobbing noises, when he looked at the camera, his eyes were dry. He even commented that he can't cry, even though he'd just acted like he cried. His whole 35-minute monologue on the way to the police station sounded like a prepared performance, rather than the words of a grieving husband. At the station, it didn't get any more rational. Skylar continued with his story that he simply shook his rifle while cleaning it and it went off into Danielle's head. Yeah. So I took the rifle and I, I took the magazine out. I took the magazine out and I I I don't know what the f happened. Like I didn't charge it, I didn't pull the trigger in. I, I hit the safety. I turned the safety from safe to semi because I was about to charge it to make sure it was clear. Even though when I gave it to her, I knew it wasn't around. So here I think that when maybe when I was gone, she might have put a round in the chamber maybe, not knowing what she was doing. Make your wife look stupid after you've fired at her in the head. Several things didn't add up in his story though. First of all, who cleans a rifle one foot away from their partner's head? Second of all, he kept changing his story. Initially he said he'd left the rifle in the closet with the magazine far away from it. Then he said he removed the magazine as he put the rifle back in the safe. As the detectives kept asking Skylar to repeat his story, the details continued to change. The story became that Danielle asked him to put the rifle away. 30 minutes before this all happened, she took it from the closet into the bed, into the office. Okay. And she said, I don't need this anymore, I just put it away. Skylar's interrogation lasted five hours, but the detectives didn't waste much time before they told him what they thought of his bogus stories. I really have no problem Because your story doesn't make sense. There's a huge gap in your story. You're detailed all the way through up to the point where we had to talk to you for two and a half hours to get you to realize that we're smarter than you think and you shouldered a weapon because the fucking trajectory of that fucking round didn't match up. So immediately you changed the fucking story. That Skylar just stood there quietly and listened to the detective say his point of view. Then he changed his story again, but this time he said it was no accident. Firing the weapon or me pulling the trigger, me pulling the trigger was not an accident. Okay, me, the, the you know I did not know there was a round in there. Her getting hit with that round, that was that, and I was not. It was an accident, and I was not mad. I was not angry. By now, the detectives knew better than to believe Skyler. There was no way he'd pulled the trigger as a joke, not knowing the gun was loaded. Why would he do that in the first place? What sort of joke was that? So the investigators took a look at Skylar and Danielle's relationship. Over the following couple of days, enough people came forward to paint the full picture. Carrie Faz, the wife of Skylar's friend Anthony, 
visited the police station the day after his interrogation. She told the detectives that Skyler was not only a controlling partner, but an abuser too. Throughout their relationship, Kari witnessed Danielle slowly switch into long sleeves just to hide her many bruises. Danielle was completely controlled by Skyler. He didn't allow her to attend her friend's events, and on a few occasions, he'd even banned her from leaving the apartment. Kari also remembers Skyler being extremely jealous of his wife, but this time their arguments didn't revolve around Danielle's childhood friend, Jeremy. They focused on Michael, Danielle's boss. Skyler was convinced Danielle was having an affair with Michael. The detectives knew this very well could be the motive. Unfortunately, many controlling partners become the most aggressive in fits of jealousy, and the police could prove that there was something there. From the crime scene, they retrieved a receipt seat for roses. Danielle had received them from Michael a while ago. And there was another catch. During the three-week training, Skylar wasn't allowed to drink. So, when he was getting ready to come home, he asked Danielle to buy him two bottles of whiskey. When he got home, Danielle was waiting for him with the two bottles, but one of them had been bought by Michael. And during the three weeks that Skylar was away, Danielle met with her childhood friend Jeremy. She'd written to Kari about it. When she spoke to the cops, Kari said that perhaps Skylar had seen her texts about Jeremy when he had a jealous fit. The police interviewed Michael and asked him about his relationship with Danielle. So did the relationship become more than just a working relationship? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I, we never did anything together whatsoever. But as Danielle was Michael's first hire, he was happy to buy her a thing or two every now and then as a form of encouragement. Then the detectives interviewed Jeremy. He'd met with Danielle just a few days before her murder. So you said two times you spent the night in the last three weeks over there. Yes, sir. And you were over there Wednesday night prior, but you didn't spend the night? No, sir. Okay. Did, uh, um, were you over there any other nights other than the two that you spent in the three weeks? I went to the mall with her one time. Jeremy also confirmed that there was nothing romantic between him and Danielle, but he also confirmed that Skylar was an abusive husband. Enough people had spoken out. The police charged Skylar Nemitz with the first degree murder of Danielle. Skyler was held on a $1 million bond. When she heard this, his mother threw her life away for him. She sold her house, her car, her jewelry, all to get him out of the county jail and hire a top lawyer for his defense. Meanwhile, 48 Hours interviewed Skyler while he was under arrest, and he almost seemed to mock his mother for selling everything. She doesn't have a car anymore. I mean, that's all because of me. And yet, at the same time, she wants to do this. I mean, I did have to explain to my mom that what I did was, you know, in the state of Washington, classified as negligence. Skyler remained cocky and arrogant whenever he spoke about his deed. He continuously denied his responsibility for the death of his wife and made bad jokes or casual remarks about the whole situation. However, during his 2016 trial, the prosecution would paint a different picture. Their first and last argument against Skyler wasn't that he didn't make the 911 call. In fact, he was busy cleaning his apartment and hiding evidence when the neighbors called and the officer arrived at the crime scene. I put my hand on the right side of her head and I put it to my chest and I wrapped my arm around her. I put it to my chest and I started saying her name. There was no reaction, no movement, no nothing. I couldn't be in there anymore. couldn't drag me away. It was my wife. You just shot your wife in the head. You're not rendering medical aid to her. You're not calling 911. You're cleaning up the apartment. You're hiding things in the crime scene. If I accidentally hurt somebody, I'm going to be doing everything in my willpower to make sure they're okay. The prosecution's other argument was that Skyler was famous for his skill around guns. He'd fired his first gun when he was only four. By his teenage years, he was already assembling and customizing his own guns. There is no way he would accidentally pull a trigger or willingly do so believing the gun wasn't loaded and he wouldn't fool around at such a short distance from his wife. This was an accidental shooting, not intentional. How in the world do you explain that he hit her dead center back of the head? 
He's a trained soldier. That's what your optics are when you're looking at this evidence. Then there were many nasty text messages between the couple. Throughout their relationship, Skylar insulted Danielle, calling her names and controlling her every move. These messages didn't indicate that Skylar would want Danielle dead, but they painted Skylar as a manipulative husband with a short temper. And such a husband is very likely to point and shoot, especially in a jealous rage. Then Skylar took the stand and defended himself. He told yet another version of the story, where when he'd realized what he'd done, he called out Danielle's name and then the thought of taking his own life out of guilt. But that's when the neighbors started pounding on the door and he changed his mind. Then the prosecution asked him why he didn't call 911 or attempt to resuscitate Danielle. He simply said he was certain she was already dead. Okay, so you start cleaning the apartment? And it turns out he did so for a long time. You see, after firing the gun, Skylar injured his finger and he left blood marks throughout the apartment. The police were also able to track down these spatters and determined that he went through every room of his home before the emergency services arrived. Okay, and we also know that you left a smear on the top of the refrigerator in the kitchen, correct? Yes, I've seen that picture. Okay, and you also left a smear by the slider, correct? Yes, I've also seen that picture. And that would positively indicate areas that you went before you ever answered the door, correct? Yes, possibly. Possibly? One particularly suspicious thing he did was flush the whiskey down the toilet. The very whiskey that might have started their last jealous argument. But as he couldn't give a straight answer to that, Skylar broke down in tears and started saying how much he loved his wife. I went up to my wife on the left side and I saw her face and my wife wasn't there anymore. I saw the gunshot wound. Where did you see it? I saw it on the back of her head. Did you know she was dead? Yeah, I knew she was dead. Skylar's defense team also painted him as a victim of his own silly mistake. A young soldier boy traumatized by the death of his wife. They want to take a kid who's panicked and freaked out and say, ah, look, there's your premeditated murderer. When in fact, the psychological evidence and the forensic evidence and the evidence from the witnesses suggest just the opposite. There's a kid who didn't plan anything out and didn't think ahead and didn't intend to kill his wife and absolutely broke apart when that happened. Should we feel sorry that he lost his wife if he was the one that harmed her? On March 3rd, 2016, Skylar Nemitz was found guilty of manslaughter after seven days of deliberation. He was cleared of the first degree murder as there was no clear intention to kill beforehand. He was sentenced to 13 and a half years in prison. Danielle's aunt commented, We have to accept that justice. I'm somewhat disappointed, but I did leave this up to God and this is what he came up with. Skyler will be free in 2029, thanks to the efforts of his defense team. But will he learn to accept the responsibility by the time he gets out? Danielle's friends and family are left with a world of pain and frustration. Danielle might never get the justice she deserves if her killer refuses to admit that he wanted her dead. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more. See you next time and stay safe.